I, I know a little bit about rural growing up in a town of 700 and running a statewide race in a place like North Dakota. We know what rural means. We know what red means. We know what it means to be a flyover state. But we know, all of you in this room, that the path to the White House runs through rural America. And we have, I'm going to be really short because we have so many amazing speakers with us today. I do want to introduce our Vice Chair, Leon Brathwaite. And our Secretary, Lucas Freilich. I, I didn't see any of my other officers or steering committee members here, but if you are here, raise a hand. I think they're all doing other things right now. I don't want to miss them. If I see any of them come in, I'll make sure to flag them because we have an amazing team of people on our Rural Council Steering Committee. So um, with that, I am very excited to introduce a dear friend of mine, a mentor to me, and someone who knows rural America better than almost anyone, my forever senator, Heidi Heitkamp. <laughs> It's so good to be with my people. Way to go. I think we're the most courageous Democrats in America. Woo! Huh? I, 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 um, some of you may have noticed that um, I have been fairly exuberant with the selection of Tim Walls as our um, vice presidential nominee. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of talking for Tim. Tim called me when he, he was clear that he was at least being in consideration and asked if I would um, talk to the media about what he would bring to the campaign. And I could hardly contain myself. I'm, I'm not usually, I'm usually pretty measured, but um, I just went off the rails because I said, I dare them. I dare the Republicans to say, we are the elite party. I dare them to say that we don't know and we don't have people in our party who care about rural America. I dare them to say that we are not rural. Tim, I mean, when you say, you know, the, the whole thing of I think just his first trip to San Francisco was a couple weeks ago, right? Right? I mean, you know, he's, he's, he is so authentic and so real. I said, just, if he walked through a county fair in any of your states, you wouldn't even notice him because he looked like everybody else who's there, right? <laughs> and, I, and I said, you know what about Tim Walls? Guess what? He doesn't have to go to Cabela's to find a hunting outfit before he shoots the ad, <laughs> right? He got a whole closet of hats and, and uh, T-shirts and uh, uh, real, real, uh, uh, real life experiences. And so... I also have to mention, you know, another Dakotan, and don't groan too loud. I, I thought it was pretty amazing when Christy Nome, the governor of South Dakota, is there anyone here from South Dakota? <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. And she automatically started in on Tim Walls. Like, instead of saying, congratulations, Tim, I hope that you remember, you know, just something polite. Of course, it's a diatribe about how he is a socialist and how he doesn't care about people and he's just a big spending liberal. And, and uh, I don't think that was a good idea for her because the number of um, hunting pictures of Tim hunting with his dog and the comments saying, at least the gun's not pointed in the wrong direction. <laughs> so what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us, our ability to organize? What does this mean for our ability to um, take back rural America? And my, you know, I'm not a political genius, but I do know a little bit about winning campaigns in um, pretty tough states. And what, what I believe is if we can just do 5% better. If we can just do 5% better, and then the next time do 10% better, and the next time do 20% better, and bring back rationality, because I know in many of your states, what's happened as we have become, it, is, it be, has become more difficult for us to elect Democrats, 
is the Republicans start picking on each other and they have gotten, dare I say, weird, <laughs> right? I mean, you probably have state legislatures that are full of people who are dismantling every important initiative for working families in America. You probably have, have um, people in your state, representing your state, who don't care about representing everyone, who will say hurtful, hateful things, um, whether it is, um, uh, our, whether it is about um, our uh, LGTBQ plus, I always get the numbers wrong, um, uh, uh, neighbors, or whether it is about making sure that we have um, safe nursing homes for our elderly. You just take the whole range. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about an organization that I started. Um, when I got done running for the Senate, I ended up with a lot of money coming to me, gratefully, at the end of the campaign. Well, in North Dakota, you can't really spend that much money. Um, and so I ended up with money left over, and I, I, I'm a former attorney general of my state, and I thought, as, as somebody who cares about the purpose, spending money for the purpose for which it was given, right? I mean, these were dollars that probably some of you even sent to me. I said, I don't know a lot about winning elections in Chicago. I don't but I know that we need to do better in rural America. And so I formed an organization, a C4 organization called One Country Project. And the One Country Project, it was interesting because when we were talking about what we were gonna name it, there was a lot of, well, it should be the Rural America Democratic Project, blah, 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 and I said, no. What's happening in America is people are trying to divide us. And I will tell anyone what a family in New York State wants is the same thing that a family in North Dakota wants. They want good health care. They want good education. They want government to work for them. They want to be able to feed their families. They want to be able to raise their kids. And they want security and safety. Those things don't change whether you're urban or rural. We are one country, and we cannot let people continue to divide us or define us. We are. So what we do at One Country is we do a lot of um, seminars, we do a lot of speaking, we do a lot of research, and I want you all to check out the One Country Project websites, onecountryproject.org, and it, it will have a blueprint for issues that we should be talking about in this campaign, brag, bragging about in this campaign, because this administration has made mammoth amounts of investment mammoth amounts of commitments to rural America that don't even get recognized. I was with, a couple years ago, I was with um, Secretary Vilsack. He's not here so I can call him Secretary, I guess. They're really fussy about this honorable or secretary thing around here. Um, so I was with Secretary Vilsack and, and they were at a rural development project in rural Minnesota and he came to the project because rural development had basically secured the loan and guaranteed the loan. And so he was standing there and he, he approached the, the business owner who was the beneficiary of this loan and he said, what are you doing here? And Tom said, well, you know, this, is, this was made possible, this project was made possible by the um, uh, rural development uh, group at, at the, um, at the um, USDA. And he goes, no, it wasn't. This isn't about government. Right? This is, this is akin to keep your, keep your government hands off my Medicare, right? And so we don't talk enough about what these programs mean. So I will tell you what I think is so important to talk about. And number one is health care. And not just reproductive rights, but access to good quality health care. In, in, in North Dakota, in North Dakota, we have locations where literally if you're in you know, the last month of your pregnancy, you better move to, to you know, stay with a relative in a place where you can deliver a baby because those opportunities are maybe 100, 150 miles away for some of our residents. I mean, think about that. Think about the absolute essential need that we have to maintain rural health care and what that can look like and who's talking about it. And do you notice, you notice a couple things about the Affordable Care Act, right? 
we all call it the Affordable Care Act. Ever since it's become popular, they don't call it Obamacare anymore, do they? They, 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 don't, they don't think to, that that's Obamacare, but we know that, that Obamacare has made it possible for our rural hospitals to stay open. It's made it possible, you bet. It's, it's made it possible for us to have mental health care in rural America. It has made it possible for farmers who may not be millionaire farmers to afford their health care premium. And that's going to phase out in 2025. And you should challenge the Republican running for Congress in your, in your state to say, are you going to expand and continue the subsidies that were made available during that COVID period for the Affordable Care Act? Because it has made health care so much more affordable for rural Americans. And so we've got to be talking about health care, and we'll have all of this on our website. We've got to be talking about rural housing. And those of you who grew up in places like, yeah, we grew up in places like I grew up, you know that maybe, maybe there's a house there, but it's not in any shape to live in. And we've, you know, and infrastructure. I talked to a, a, a local public official who basically said, guess what? I can't afford to redo my water system in my hometown. It's too expensive guess what made it possible for them to redo their water system? The investment that the Biden administration has made in infrastructure. We need to be talking about clean water. We need to talk about housing. We need to be talking about infrastructure in our small towns. And we need to be challenging all of these people who say, you don't get us. Because guess what? The Democratic Party knows full well what rural America needs. They need good housing. They need good education. They need good health care. And they need the ability, right, and they need the ability to take care of our veterans. You know, think about this. And I want to do a shout out for my good friend, John Tester. He's not here this week. I think he might still be harvesting. Montana, who's here from Montana? Woo, all right. We want to help you any way we can because John is the last legitimate farmer in the United States Congress. And he deserves to, be re to return to the United States Senate. But he's going to need some help in rural Montana. He's going to need a lot of people making phone calls, a lot of people knocking doors. And so what I would tell you is we're going to do 5% better because we're going to have a message a message of hope and opportunity for rural America, a message that's going to resonate. And I want to stop with this. I want to stop with the Farm Bill. You know, when, when we, st people always ask me, how, how did it turn out that North Dakota, you know, went from being this fairly purple, blue, you know, congressional delegation to you know, losing it all? And I said, I can tell you when that happened. It's when the Republicans decided they better get on board with the Farm Bill. Because before that, when they would veto farm bills, we had a pretty good argument. But now, when we look at the farm bill, guess who's holding it up? Not Democrats. Democrats are ready to negotiate. It's Republicans in the House. And you say, well, they got the majority. Why can't they get a farm bill done? I'll tell you why they can't get a farm bill done. They can't get a farm bill done because at least 20 to 30 Freedom Caucus Republicans will never vote for a farm bill. And they're refusing to compromise with the Democrats. And so you should be talking about the Republicans not getting a farm bill done and having to once again do an extension, right? I mean, we have plenty to talk about. We're going to have a lot of fun in this election because Tim Walz is going to be out there like he was in Nebraska telling it the way it is. Someone said, well, you know, J.D. Vance is from rural America. I said, he hasn't lived in rural America. He left when he was 18. Never turned back. Went to Silicon Valley. Come on. You're not. I mean, Tim Walls has 60 years of being one of us. And so we're going to have a lot to talk about. We're going to have a lot of reasons to be optimistic. And we're going to continue to fight. And when this election's over, we are not going silently back into the shadows of the Democratic Party. Right? We are going to stand up and say, you want to see a tough Democrat? See a rural Democrat who's out there talking the talk, walking the walk, getting things done for rural America. Thank you so much for letting me come.
One more quick round for Senator Heidi Heitkamp. I'm next going to introduce another one of our wonderful vice chairs, Coleman Elridge. Well, hello, Rural Council. Hello, Rural Council. Anybody proud to be a Democrat? So I have the honor, the pleasure of having one of the greatest governors in the country, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. If you saw last night, Governor Andy Bashir, you know why, in Kentucky, where folks said we could not elect a Democratic governor, let alone re-elect a Democratic governor, this governor beat a Trump-endorsed, Mitch McConnell-picked candidate not once, but twice. But here's the other thing you need to know about my governor. It's that he leads with his values. Now, his values, our values, are that of compassion and kindness and how we move forward together. Their values are linked maybe to convictions, 34 of them. Let it sink in. <laughs> At the end of the day, Andy Bashir has been the kind of governor that Kentucky and rural America has needed. He has seen what people need, and he has delivered every step of the way. How you win in rural America is not as Democrats or Republicans or independents, it is as people first. And that is what Andy Bashir has done. Please join me in welcoming Governor Andy Bashir. Good to see you. Thank you all. Folks, my name is Andy Bashir, and I am the proud Democratic governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I'm living proof that Democrats can and should win in rural America. If you don't know me, I'm the guy that last November beat Mitch McConnell's handpicked candidate. I'm the guy that last November beat Donald Trump's handpicked candidate. And together this November, we're going to beat him again and elect Kamala Harris as our next president. I'll tell you how I govern in a rural state. I'm a proud pro-union governor. I'm a proud pro-public education governor. I'm a proud pro-choice governor. I am a proud diversity governor, pro-diversity governor. And I'm a proud pro-Kamala Harris for president governor. In Kentucky, we've shown up every day to do the hard work that Kamala Harris has been doing as vice president, to make sure that we are lifting up every single American and leaving no one behind. I recognize, like we do in rural America, that when people wake up in the morning, they're not thinking about polls. They're likely not even thinking about this election. They're thinking about their job and whether they make enough to support their family. They're thinking about their next doctor's appointment and how far they're going to have to drive to get there. They're thinking about the roads and the bridges they travel that day. They're thinking about uh, the public school that they drop their kids off at. And they're thinking about public safety in their communities. And with the Republicans going to the extreme ends that they are on every issue, now is our time to both run and govern on those issues that matter the most to our people. And when we do that, we don't move a state or the country to the right or the left. We move it forward for every single American. 
Kamala Harris and Tim Walz believe like I do, that yes, we run as proud Democrats, and folks, aren't we proud Democrats? But the moment we win, we take those hats off and we serve every single American. We do that by what we've done in Kentucky, rolling up our sleeves and going to work. Last year, Kentucky was number three in per capita economic development. The year before, number two. We are number three in the creation of rural jobs in this country. We're expanding health care to every area of Kentucky with now two pediatric autism centers in Appalachia with, yeah, with more to come. We're building what we call the Mountain Parkway, the first four-lane highway into eastern Kentucky to make sure we're opening up opportunities for everyone. When we invest in every parts of our state, we improve the lives of all of our people. That opens the hearts, that opens the minds, and it opens our ability to compete. And I'm here to tell you we have to show up in every state in every community, in every county, urban and rural, all across America. I believe that our counties aren't red or blue. They are full of American families who deserve the very best, the best jobs, the best health care, the best infrastructure. And this energy we have right now, and doesn't the vice president have this energy that's <laughs> It's going to help her and Tim Walls win, and then it's going to help us build a better America. Because right now, you've seen it, we're at a boiling point in this country, and we deserve better. You know, every day, it's the back and forth. We're asked to pick a side in everything from the car we drive to the beer we drink when we know that the most important issues aren't necessarily D or R red or blue. We deserve an America where we remember that we are Americans first and everything else second or third. And I know the Vice President, and I know that's exactly how she's going to govern. She is smart and she is strong, and that's going to make her a good President. But she's also kind and has empathy, and that's going to make her a great President. I can't wait to see some of the programs that she's announced that are about helping us get through right now that complement President Joe Biden's long-term economic strategies that are bringing new jobs to rural America and all across this country. We are at a moment in time where one candidate is trying to pull us back, that is trying to settle old grievances, and one candidate that's trying to move us forward. Kamala Harris says, we're not going back. Or as we say in Kentucky, we ain't going back. But more than that, she and Tim Walls are going to lead us into a better future, one where we can talk to our neighbors, one where neighbors are no longer arguing with each other, one where we talk together about how we can improve everybody's life, Democrat, Independent, or Republican. This is our chance at the Democratic National Convention. And how was last night, the first night of the Democratic <laughs> National Convention? This is our chance, yes, to be proud Democrats, but to show everyone in this country, Republican, Independent, Democrat, or other, that there is room for them in this campaign, that there is room for them with us. We believe in an America where everyone deserves respect, where everyone has value. So while Donald Trump is trying to call people names, while J.D. Vance is calling adults without children sociopaths and psychopaths, we want everyone to know that we see you, we value you, we will never call you names, and once again, you have a place right here with us. <laughs> and I'm proud to be here with you today because my first job was mucking stalls at a horse farm. 
And if anything prepares you for politics, it's muck and stalls at a horse farm. But, but I've never seen it as deep as what we see with former President Trump and J.D. Vance. Let me tell you, they would fill up any barn I've ever been in. And it's time we took them outside and spread them around a field and never had to deal with them ever again. So I'm really grateful. And folks, you may know I went through this thing for the last couple weeks. I think they called it the Veep Stakes. Hey, and I'm proud that a governor from rural America was in that Veep Stakes. Thank you. But let me tell you what, Tim Walls is a great friend. He is a great governor, and he's going to be an amazing vice president. He was the best choice. But what I got to do during it, and what I'm going to continue to do, is show up in places where we need to show up more often. I got to go to Iowa. I got to go to Oklahoma. We got to talk about how we are going to fight together, where we're going to leave out no part of America, where we're going to fight for every community, every county, every part of this country. All of our people deserve great leadership, and that's exactly what they are going to get when we elect Kamala Harris as our next President of the United States. Thank you all very much. Now I am proud to introduce you to my friend, our secretary, Lucas Freilich. <laughs> I'm a little bit taller, stand by, okay. Thank you. It's gonna be hard to follow that, I think, so I'll make this really short. First, I have to say, where are my Wyoming friends at? Give me some, great, good, hello. So, my next speaker, well, our next speaker that we're going to introduce is the co-chair of the Dirt Road Democrats PAC. Now, I could go into that, but honestly, I think he can do a much better job. But let's, who is this mysterious man that I'm describing? He's a native of Pine Bluffs, Arkansas. Fun town, I'm sure. I, it's a fun town, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, I got it. Yeah, it's a good town. <laughs> Thank you for playing along. He was the first African-American majority party nominee for governor in his state's history, which is a pretty big deal. His love for science took him to Morehouse College, where he earned a physics and a math degree. Oh no, but he didn't stop there. He then went to NASA, where he interned as a NASA astronaut, with a NASA, a NASA astronaut, excuse me. And then he went on to MIT, where he earned not one, but two master's degrees. But instead of just resting, nope, he decided to also get a PhD, because why not? <laughs> All that free time, right? Now, his love for Christ drove him to teach Sunday school at a very young age, and he's now an ordained minister. I would like to introduce all of you to Chris Jones. All right, all right, all right. When we fight, when we fight, when we fight, and when we show up, I'm black and I'm rule. I'm an ordained minister and I'm rule. I'm a girl dad and I'm rule. 
I have a PhD from MIT and I'm rural. I grew up riding dirt bikes, eating honeysuckle and fighting grasshoppers. I'm rural. Look, it is great to be here. Uh, thank you all. The Rural Caucus is amazing. I am excited. Bree Maxwell, give her a, shout, a hand clap. She is phenomenal. She is doing the thing. And, and we know without a doubt, we can't win these races without rule. And for far too long, we have not paid enough attention to rural areas. We have not. So, so let me quickly dispel a couple of myths, and I'm going to tell you what the dirt road Democrats are doing. The myth that I'm going to first dispel is that Arkansas is a red state. I, I, I see some of my Arkansan friends over there, and we know. So you, you, you see what's happening in Arkansas, you think it's a red state. No, we're not a red state, we're a non-voting state. We're a non-voting state. We have three million people in Arkansas. We have about over two million people that are registered to vote. About 900,000 voted in the last election. That's right. So it's our job to show up and pull them to the polls. And you know where a lot of those folks are? In rural areas. In rural areas. And, and that story plays itself out in all of our states, where if you just show up, people will begin to see something different. And and, and, and we surely see it happening in Kentucky, and we're following their lead. My co-chair for the Dirt Road Democrats is Brandon Presley, who almost won and beat Tate Reeves, y'all. We're building. So what does Dirt Road Democrats do? We are here to be the wind behind the back in the work that you all are doing. That's what we're here to do. How do we know it works? Let's look at Georgia. In Georgia, Dirt Road Democrats helped invest in Georgia, and Georgia won 158 out of 150, not one, increased voter turnout in 158 out of 159 counties. And, and, and we know that that meant that the vote totals increased by a million, and we won Georgia by 11,780 votes. All right? That's a number that somebody paid real close attention to. So the Dirt Road Democrats is here to find you all and to say, we know you're showing up, so we're going to show up with you. We know state parties are doing the work, so we're going to do the work with you. We know that you all have organizations like Senator Heitkamp um, was organization, and we're going to support that work. That's what Dirt Road Democrats is about because, as was said earlier, 5%, some of these rural areas, game changer. 5% in Arkansas, and we break the supermajority. And when we break the supermajority, we stop the MAGA extremist Trump sycophant Sarah Sanders. Yes. So I ran against Sarah Sanders, and I know what it's like. But let me tell you, when you go out in rural America, when you go out in rural Arkansas, and you actually tell them what's going on and what the Democrats do, that's when you win. Part of our challenge is we aren't showing up. But that's not the case anymore, because we have a great person at the top of the ticket in Kamala Harris. Yes. And she has a great partner in Tim Walls. And they are showing up. I'm telling you, I traveled the state. I went to all 75 counties. And I will tell you a story about one county I went to, Huntsville, Arkansas, North Central Arkansas. Traveled there, and the first time I went, I did three statewide tours. The first time I went, two people showed up. I gave them just as much attention as if 200 showed up. Three months later, I went back, and 40 people showed up. Yes. And then I went back near the end of the race, and 70 people showed up to walk a mile in Huntsville, where a hotel is named after Governor Earl Faubus. But, but that's not the beauty of the story. The last week of the election, I went back through the, 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 the town of Huntsville. And one of the two people I met with 
when I first went there, he pulled me aside and he said, Chris, I got to tell you something. My neighbor, he's 6'5", and he has Confederate flags tattooed on his body. Trump flags in his yard. He pulled me aside last week and he said, uh, you know that guy, Chris Jones? My, my friend was like, yeah. He's like, I'm going to vote for him. Yeah. Right. And, and my friend said, that's why. And he said, because he showed up. So, we, I, I didn't get across the finish line, but that's okay. Because we showed up and we changed some minds. We're going to get Harris and Walls across the finish line, you all. We're going to do the work to break some supermajorities, you all. We're going to do the work to make sure we hold the Senate and pick up the House. Because we can do this. So, I, I, I want to end with one more story. Um, I, I, first of all, let me tell you, I love you all. Uh, this, this, this week is amazing. This work is amazing. What we're doing is amazing. And the story I want to tell you about is about Rector, Arkansas. Rector, Arkansas is in northeast Arkansas. And they have an amazing parade. And I went there and when I was campaigning, and I went to the Labor Day event afterwards, walking around talking to people, and several people told me, you know, the last time we saw a Democrat up here was when Bill Clinton ran for office. <laughs> and then I asked them in conversation, and the last time they saw a black person running for office was never. <laughs> but we fixed that. But in Rector, Arkansas, because I showed up, we significantly increased voter turnout in Rector, Arkansas. When we show up, we win. When we fight, we win. Let's show up, let's fight, let's keep it going, let's get Harrison Walls across the finish line, and let's not stop there. Dirt Road Democrats is here to help you all. Next up, I am very honored to introduce you to another governor from rural Red America, someone who has worked really hard on competent government with integrity, someone who cares about public education and balancing the budget, someone who cares about our child welfare system and worked hard to reform that, and that's something near and dear to my heart. I am very proud to welcome Governor Laura Kelly. <laughs> I got to tell you, I have not seen this many Democrats in rural Kansas ever. <laughs> I think we'd have to put them all in the same room, bringing them from hundreds of miles apart. So, but I do like this look uh, very, very much. There's an entire big room of all of you. You know, if you listen to some of the news media, you would think that we are some kind of rare endangered species. You know, to be studied in a lab or under glass in a museum, the rural Democrat. Well, I come to you as the proud Democratic governor of the great rural state of Kansas. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are surprised to hear Kansas has a Democratic governor. Uh, even within our own party, mostly people you know, from the more congested coastlines of our country, they say, wow, you won in Kansas? And I said, no, I won twice in Kansas. <laughs> so I'll, I'll lean in a little closer. 
when after they say, well, how could you possibly win and win twice in Kansas? I lean in a little closer, I lower my voice, so they really feel like I'm revealing a secret. And I say, the secret to winning over rural folks. Talk to them about their schools. Talk to them about affordable health care. Talk to them about their roads. Talk to them about child care. Talk to them about housing. Well, hang on, Governor. Those sound like the same issues we all care about. And I'd say, you'd be right about that. <laughs> Look, democratic values are rural values. And we should say it loud and clear. Democrats, Democrats are for strong schools, a strong middle class, and a strong workforce. Democrats, excuse me, and by the way, I think Kansas showed this nation a couple of years ago that the value of respecting women's privacy and their basic reproductive rights, that's also a democratic value and a rural value. Just look at what's happening in the ballot box on that issue in one rural state after another. You don't win in America just because you figured out some secret formula or cracked some code. You win in rural America when you decide you want to win in rural America. When you make it a priority. When you show up, not just for pictures, but to listen, to learn, to not only appreciate our rural way of life, but to appreciate why we love that rural way of life, why we're so proud of that way of life, and why it is so important to protect. You know, even in these days of such polarization and division, we see the very best of us in our rural communities, where that spirit of neighbor helping neighbor is strong, where we watch over each other's kids, where we lend a hand to someone in need. I see it every day in Kansas, and I'm sure that you see it all across your communities too. Now, I'm not here only representing Kansas. I'm also here as the chair of the DGA. And at the, well, condolences, <laughs> condolences accepted. <laughs> and at the DGA, when it comes to competing in rural places, we put our money where our mouths are. We invested $20 million in Kentucky last year to help reelect Governor Bashir. And we are off to the races in North Carolina to make sure that rural state stays blue. And of course then, uh, there's that rural governor of the great state of Minnesota. The reason I'm now chair of the Democratic Governors Association is because our previous chair, Governor Walls, got a little busy lately. So let me just say a word about my friend, Tim Walls. He re represents everything good and decent about the Midwest, about rural America, about America, period. He's a man who has committed his life to service in just about every way you can imagine. Service to our nation in the military, service to his community as a teacher and as a coach, service to his state, first in Congress, then in the governor's office. This is a man who went to Congress from very conservative areas of Minnesota, but not because he cracked some secret rural code, but because the voters there came to learn that with Coach Walls, what you see is what you get. And what you see and what you get is a level of optimism and empathy and sheer decency that's so needed in our national politics today. So come this November, with Tim Walls on the ticket, I'm looking forward to finally saying those three words I've always wanted to say. Hello, Madam President. So, let me say it again, because it feels so good. Hello, Madam President. 
So now, let's go. Let's go win. And let's shock everyone by doing it in rural America. One more hand for Governor Kelly. I need to give one quick shout out to my, my friend and a founder of the Rural Council, Deb Kozakowski. De Deb, Deb what, what year was it? What year was it, Deb? Okay, so in the early 2000s, late 90s, Deb worked really, really hard to start with a rural working group. That is the best they would do for us at that time. And she pushed really hard to create the Rural Council and we're very, very grateful for that. Thank you, Deb. For those, those who couldn't hear, what Deb's saying is that is she and her co-founder stalked Terry McAuliffe for many, many weeks and months until he finally agreed to give them what they want. And so we're grateful for your persistence. Yes. <laughs> um, next up, I'm excited to introduce you to someone who I think you will get to know well um, and who has big things coming for her. She is running for the United States Senate in Utah. Welcome, Caroline Gleek. All right. Having traveled all over Utah as a Democrat running in a red rural state, what unites us deeply is our love of the land, the big blue skies, the birds chirping, because yes, I'm entering the birding era of my life strong, the open landscapes, the untouched scenery, the wildlife, including us, because we are wildlife. Our connection to nature, it is vital to our human health, to our well-being, and it's what I've devoted my life to. I'm Caroline Gleick. I am the Democratic nominee running to replace Mitt Romney in the United States Senate. <laughs> in a state that is 80% rural, 80% of my state is rural. And I've always had this dream of climbing the biggest mountains and running across these wild, untouched landscapes. And when I told people about my dreams, they dismissed me. They told me it was impossible, but I have gone on to climb the highest peaks, to run ultra marathons, and I will continue to fight and to defy stereotypes and achieve what other people say is impossible. Because we cannot turn our back on states like Utah. There are Democratic voters that I've spoken to across the state that have been waiting for someone to come to talk to them for years. And in these communities, we love the unpaved streets where you can walk your dog without a leash. Kids can run free. They can walk to school and to the store and eat farm fresh food. We love the hometown values 
a place where you know your neighbors, and we need to give kids the opportunity to live where they grew up. And that is why it is imperative that we continue the Biden-Harris administration's work by electing Vice President Harris and Governor Walz to continue these historic investments in clean, renewable energy because the clean energy economy of America, the future is led by good-paying union jobs, American-led manufacturing. We need to bring back the union jobs and break up mega corporations. We need smart immigration policy to reverse rural decline. Systemic public transportation would love to see a high-speed bullet train. We need to address the rural health care healthcare decline, and especially the disproportionate gap that is causing higher than average maternal mortality rates in rural areas. We cannot have women die. And we have to keep organizing and investing in red states and rural America because we can and we will win. So what I want you to do is to get out there, go to these places, celebrate the land, and under those big blue skies, get out there, feel it, feel our humanity, our shared humanity that these wild places give us. And when we have strong candidates and campaigns at the top of the tickets, it's vital. So if you can, go to our website, carolineforutah.com, and if you can chip in a couple bucks, it will help us invest in Utah, in the critical infrastructure. When we do that, together, we can take Utah and turn it into blue Utah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. I'm going to give, give you that one more time, carolineforutah.com. We're, we're really grateful, especially when women step up to run, especially in these really difficult states. So make sure you give her some love and support. Okay. Next up, I am really proud to introduce you to a wonderful friend to rural America, the Honorable Sochi Torres-Small. Good afternoon, rural America. It is so good to see all of you here. It is even better to see you as a crucial part of Kamala Harris's path to victory. In 2018, and a safe place for them to be. We know that rural America looks like a mom who's getting ready for a second child and has to drive hours for her doctor's appointments and schedule daycare for her kids or take off work to be able to do that so that she, her kid can have the best start to life. We know that rural America is full of veterans, full of farmers who know about the power of our country when we work together. I had the chance to get to serve in Congress and represent my home because that rural America showed up. Now, you may not remember this because it was three years ago, but a lot has changed since then, but I was elected in the middle of the time when Donald Trump, Trump was president, in the middle of the trade wars that were causing farmers to lose money, in the middle of rural hospitals worried about closing their doors because Donald Trump took too long to recognize the crisis of COVID. And that deathly delay caused lives. It caused lives especially in rural America. It took longer to get that care. And yet today, Donald Trump still talks about upending the Affordable Care Act, which is single-handedly responsible for keeping those rural hospitals open. Today, Donald Trump st talks about starting another trade war being tough on everyone except for Vladimir Putin. 
That's not the rural America I know. The rural America I know is quick to act for others, not quick to act for yourself when you lose and incite an insurrection. The rural America I know cares about people's kids, knows that when we invest in child tax credits that help our neighbors, it helps all of us, knows that when we invest in building bridges and roads and high-speed internet so our kids can learn wherever they live, we're building a brighter future for all of us, knows that by investing in bills like the Inflation Reduction Act, we can build six million new jobs through the, from building the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, and in rural America, from the field up and the community out. <laughs> rural America is like every single one of you because we know how to show up. And we know that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have been showing up for us. And that's why we're gonna show up at doors and make phone calls and do all the real work that rural America knows how to do to win this election. Because in rural America, we don't write anyone off. And that's why Kamala Harris is for all the people. Thank you. We have a, a special guest for you all today. She is one of our Midwestern First Ladies, soon to be Second Lady of the United States. Please join me in welcoming Gwen Walls. <laughs> Good afternoon, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, oh you're so kind, that's great. Um, this is an honor to be here. I had a few minutes in my schedule and I'm like, I would like to get there if I possibly could. So thanks for staying and um, for letting me come and thank you to the Rural Council Chair Oberson. Um, it's a really a true honor to be fit into your agenda. So I'm here to tell you that I grew up in a community twice the size of Tim Walz's. <laughs> Still not very big, right? Um, and in southwestern Minnesota, I'm a Minnesota girl, um, and I can't remember what my graduating class size was, and since they're fact-checking us on every single little tiny thing, I'm just going to say it was more than Tim's, but less than 45. So, okay, <laughs> that gives you a range um, of where I'm from. And I am uh, proud to have grown up in southwestern Minnesota, proud um, to be part of, of that network, um, and proud to be here with you today. And I just um, hoped that I might be able to uh, stop in and tell you a little bit about who I am and uh, ask that we might continue to work together for the election of Kamala and Tim. And so um, thanks, thanks again. I'm Gwen, as I said, and I am really proud to be part of this Team Harris Walls. And it's not been very long that we've been part of this team, <laughs> right? So. So, so far, so good, um, but I can't think of a better team than Kamala and Tim. They've both spent their entire careers fighting for middle-class families and understanding all kinds of issues that are really important um, to all of you and to all of us. And they grew up in those families, right? That's not a pretend thing. It's not a book written about it or anything like that. That's their real family. And they believe in giving every single person every one a chance to chase the American dream. I think that's pretty profound because I think one of the big differences is that we see the value, Tim and Kamala, me too, they see the value in every single person and every individual and don't necessarily classify them in groups immediately as the other side 
sort of seems to do. I believe together Kamala and Tim will fight for our future and they will fight for a future where we all have a place, a, a future that we all deserve. Our sons and daughters, right? Our families, all of it. So as I said, it's been just a little bit over a week since we joined um, this hot ticket here. And um, we are learning a lot. And I just want to thank you all for your patience and your help in doing that. Um, we feel that and we feel that embrace. And I can't tell you how much that means for our entire family. And like all of you, I wear a lot of different hats. Or in my case, I say I wear a lot of different shoes. OK? <laughs> I'm a mom. I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm a retired military spouse. Right now I have the great honor of being the First Lady of Minnesota. That's a pretty great gig. <laughs> and I'm also a teacher and educator. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so great. Now, are there any teachers here today? OK, that is fabulous. I want to say thank you for your work, right? Thank you for your work, teachers. Um, it is a back to school time. And no matter if you're retired or still in the classroom or doing any sort of job in education, we feel it in our bones, right? You may find yourself at Target in the pencil and pen aisle and not even know how you got there once you've been a teacher. <laughs> It's just where you go at this time of year. It's a pull. It's a gravitational pull. But that's how Tim and I met, not in the target aisle, but teaching, <laughs> but teaching. We were both teaching in Nebraska. He taught, what did he teach? Social studies. Very good. You passed your first quiz there. And I taught English. And where we taught in rural Nebraska was a place with not a lot of resources and a lot of challenges. And so. Um, they decided to turn the old choir room into one, into a classroom. And so they put a divider right down the middle, and Tim was on one side and I was on the other. Uh huh. It was a thin divider, a thin divider. So this might not be a surprise to you, but his class was a little louder than my class was. There was a lot of energy in that classroom. Um, but we knew right away that we shared a belief in this. We shared a belief that education can be transformative. Yeah. Right. And we saw it firsthand. I want to tell you just a little story about one example. And there, there are many, but this is just a quick example of how Tim and I saw that and how we partner. So a student of ours named Wayland was on the football team. Coach Walls coached him. And he was a student in my English classroom that year. And he was brilliant on the football field and difficult in my classroom. You know some students like this, yeah, right? Maybe you were, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Wayland had a significant reading issue. I knew it right away. He was way below grade level. And his acting out was just simply an attempt to hide from his peers and from me. And in the school where we taught, a student who was failing a core class could not participate in sports, right? That, that's a whole topic of, for another conversation, right? Because the thing that kept Waylon coming to school was playing football, right? Um, but I knew we were headed for trouble. And so I huddled with Coach Walls, and we came up with a plan. We thought, and we told Wayland, if he would come in for tutoring with me several times a week, either before school, during lunch, or if we had time after school, he could keep playing football. But he had to come to tutoring, and we had to work hard on reading. He agreed, and he worked hard. I saw some of what I witnessed on the football field happening in the tutoring sessions. And his reading began to approve. And he continued the tutoring even after the season ended. We never discussed that. We just kept reading, right? <laughs> but Tim would cross that thin divider 
in our classroom to come and read with Waylon, to come and talk about what he was reading, to ask him for a quick summary, to tell him what books we might be able to read next, and to cheer him on. And at the end of the year, Waylon had competence both on and off the field. Right? That's how Tim Walls and I see education and see people, one individual at a time, making a difference one person by one person and letting that ripple out. We cannot underestimate the power of seeing and recognizing individuals. Wayland went on to graduate, fr graduate from high school and we thought he had a chance to succeed. He had a shot and we're so proud of that. Tim believes so strongly that every student, every person, deserves a chance to get ahead. And I know that's a commitment that Vice President Harris shares also. And most importantly, on why we're at this convention coming together, they will fight for that vision every single day in the White House. And we, you, me, Kamala, Tim, our friends, our neighbors, our communities, we will fight for that future that we can be proud of. That's something. Right. Last thing I want to tell you about is the saying my mom used to say, me, say to me. Now, you don't know my mom, but I think you might know my mom, right? My, my mom is um, about 86. She'll be here tomorrow night. She's still the church organist, um, still gives piano lessons, and is a retired educator who still on occasion substitutes in PE. Like I said, you don't know my mom, but you know my mom, right? Yeah. And she would say to me, Gwen, do the work that is in front of you. And when I was younger, I used to think that meant the dishes, right? <laughs> but I grew to understand what that really meant and to understand that it was a profound statement about service and a profound statement about recognizing what I saw and what I needed to do through my own eyes and empowering my own spirit to do that. It's advice that's both thoughtful and actionable. So as delegates to this convention, you are already embodying this advice. You already kind of have that thing from my mom down, doing the work that's in front of us. But we have only 77 days. 77. Not long, not long, but we can do it. So I am asking you to bring with your own sense of what needs to be done in your communities and with your friends and your neighbors and those people around you. Bring that and let's convince people one at a time, community by community. Volunteer, bring a friend, have a tough conversation, talk about it in parking lots, donate, bake treats for somebody who's call timing, right? Call time. Do you know what bars are? Yeah. Yes. You know, like, yeah, little treats. Bake bars for those people who are door knocking. Door knock. Do the work. Now, I want to tell you, when Tim ran for Congress in 2006, the last thing he had been elected to was the homecoming king. <laughs> and that is not a ringing endorsement for Congress, right? But it was, that's how it was. But he won, and he won in a very tough rural district, right? In 2006, yes. And he won five more times after that, 12 years in the United States Congress. And then he ran for governor, and then he ran for governor again. We have never lost a political race. And we don't intend to start now. Because here's what I know. When we fight, we win. When we fight, 
We win! When we fight, we win! Thank you so much for letting me come today. you learn about the character of a person is is who they choose in a partner and we know Tim Walls chose well we know that this is running a little long we want you all to stick with us we've got some wonderful things left today I am next really excited to introduce to you a friend of mine from back home um, his, his sister was up here earlier. We don't get a lot of sibling pairs. Those of you from my neck of the woods would recognize Joel Heitkamp. He is, he is on talk radio, and I tell you, he knows the importance of talk radio in rural America and what that means. And so I'm going to invite Joel up here with my friend and former colleague, former State Party Chairman of Ohio, David Pepper. Thanks for including
you would never, ever give J.D. Vance your keys to the top bar. Because <laughs> the minute the fighting would start, he'd be the first one to run out the door. Fair to say? Yeah. All right, we're going to talk about Project 2025, which he wrote the foreword to. Uh, David is somebody who understands this inside and out. And I want to talk about some of the issues in 2025 that affect us in the rural area. For example, uh, eliminating Head Start, its tax plan, you know, the cuts, the snap, issues like that. And so, David, if you could, I know we're short on time, but let's go through some of these one-on-one, -on -one, eliminating head start. Yeah, well, so big picture, I mean, it, it, Donald Trump gave us the gift when he picked J.D. Vance as his head. And the Heritage Foundation does us the favor when they actually write down their absurd and deeply toxic plans. So I do think we take, it is smart to take a little bit of time to talk through them. Not only because There's so many more issues, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to, to talk to David about this one, which is lifetime caps on, on Medicare, uh, forcing people on Medicaid. I can tell you this as the husband of a caregiver, someone who was a director of nursing for years at a nursing home and ended up going into hospice and home health. This matters. This matters a lot. And so if you would speak to that, David. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bigger picture.
because I look around this room and, and I see people that have worked for a living and people that still work for a living. That's who we are as Democrats, right? I mean, that's what we do. We work, okay? When you go to work in Congress, when you make it there, you got a job to do. You got a job to do. And for rural America, that's to pass a farm bill. That's to get a farm bill done. Extension and extension, and the base price is crap. I'm going to ask you, David, when the hell does this get done? Uh, uh, they don't get anything done. So it gets done when we win the House, the Senate, and the presidency. <laughs> and but not again. I don't mean to be the trigger or the dark news, but I was asked to talk about Project 2025. Project 2025 takes the things that people like about the Farm Bill and turns them all upside down. It's the anti. -farm it's trying to split off the programs that help with nutrition, like SNAP, away from the field. So one of the most important things that happened, and Heidi talked about it, was at some point decades ago, rural and urban America were smart enough to figure out what each kind of overlooked. So if we combine SNAP and food support with other aspects of the Farm Bill, together we'll get this done. And the beauty of the Farm Bill has been it was the united rural and urban thing, and that built the Thank you, Joel and David. Hey guys, we're almost there. Two people I want to give a quick shout out to. I don't, did Ty leave? It's right there, okay. We have a candidate for the US Senate in Mississippi, Ty Pinkins. Let's give him a quick shout out and a wave. <laughs> Those of us who live in the states like Mississippi, know how hard that is to step up and run, and we are grateful for your leadership. Thank you, Ty. I also wanted to give a quick shout out here to my friend Anthony, and I think Anthony is here with Jacqueline, right? With the Rural Urban Br Bridge Institute. They handed out some materials for you. Give them a hello. Um, they are doing incredible work in rural America. Make sure you find him, one of the handout, the booklets that are on your chairs, make sure you find them and connect. Um, Last but very much not least, two friends of mine, Brianna and Teresa. Teresa is with the Rural Strong Network, and Brianna is with Contest Every Race. And speaking of what David was talking about, making sure that we are filling these ballots in every county, in every state, every zip code, we know how important that is in rural places, particularly up and down the ballot. So please stick with me for a few more minutes here to give my friends some time and attention here. So join me in welcoming Teresa and Brianna. So we are going to be very brief, but we are, um, I'm Teresa Purcell. I am the founder of the Rural Strong Network. I live in rural Washington state. I've been a rural candidate. I've been a rural activist. And I am somebody who is deeply, deeply committed. I am an evangelist for rural America. And one of the things I wanted to lift up, and I'm going to give the mic to Brianna in just a moment, is when we think about rural America, most people don't get that there are 3,144 counties in this country. 
and 2,500 of those counties have less than 100,000 people. 48% of those counties have less than 25,000 people. And when we show up, we actually can connect with those people and we can connect with our friends and neighbors and giving the people the tools that they need to have a different conversation. And every one of those counties has county commissioners and auditors and school boards and people and places where we need to be and we need to make it feel safe to actually say we're a Democrat. So there are many organizations that are doing great things in rural America right now, but the one thing that I'm focused on with the Rural Strong Network is building a new brand. And the brand is Rural Strong Building Homegrown Prosperity Together. What I wanna do, and I'm an LLC, so I can work with anyone, but I want, we, you can get, go to ruralstrong.us and you can, um, I'm hoping to get these for free, but you can get a yard sign, you can get bumper stickers, you can get those things that show your friends and neighbors that you are rural strong and you wanna have a different conversation. You wanna be able to put a democratic yard sign in your yard. You wanna be able to have the conversation about building homegrown prosperity together means we have education and healthcare and childcare and we're picking the right sets of fights. But, and, and as somebody in my rural area, I've gotten 50 emails offering me free Trump swag in the past month. And that's terrifying because that keeps Democrats from actually putting up their Democratic yard signs. So really, again, this is the focus. It's like, let's have this visual cue out there that allows us to, per, um, to have a different conversation and to invite our friends and neighbors into the conversation. And we're focused on working in those 48% of counties that have less than 25,000 people. We want to engage those folks in every county in the country because we know when we show up, our, you can buy a bumper sticker that says this, it's pretty inappropriate, but I'm gonna say it, which you can buy a bumper that has the logo that says show up, shut up, and get shit done. Because that's what our people want us to do. And, that, <laughs> and, that's, and we also have one that says building together. So I, that's the introduction of the Roll Strong Network, but I wanna give uh, Brianna a chance to talk because we're partnering with Contest Every Race that actually, well, I'm gonna let her talk about it, but we're doing the communications and this is super exciting work. Hello, every, hello everybody. Uh, I'll keep it short and sweet because I know we've all been here for a while. Um, Contest Every Race is committed to making sure that no Republican ever runs uncontested because way too often Republicans are winning simply because we're not challenging them. So next year, there's projected to be 100,000 races that go uncontested, not if we have our say in it, we want to make sure that we're recruiting folks, and it's mostly that local races, the down ballot stuff. Um, it's proven that the more Democrats at the bottom of the ticket transfer to Dems at the top of the ticket winning. In addition to our candidate recruitment, we also have a grant program for rural county parties. I actually see one of our grantees up here up front from Yavapai, Arizona. Um, wanted to shout them out. Last election cycle, they were the home to um, the Oath Keepers, who I'm sure you guys saw their armed voter suppression, and still they managed to have a historic voter turnout. So round of applause for them. Um, <laughs> rural Democrats are committed to fighting for democracy and Contest Every Race is committed to supporting that fight and investing in that fight. So if CER is not in your state yet, definitely talk to your state party about getting us in there. You can come and talk to me, um, but thank you guys all so much. Have a wonderful convention. And I'd like to give a big shout out to Kylie, who is the Rural Council Chair and to the leadership of the Rural Council, because this is an amazing group that is doing super important work. And one other point is we have an incredible opportunity with the Harris Waltz tickets to take back rural America and to lift up Democrats in rural America, but we've got to show up and we've got to stay. And that's gonna be super important. So